you okay, kid? Yeah. He'll keep. Go. Welcome back uh, to the special edition of Open Your Eyes. I'm Andy Johnson, privileged to be co-hosting here with Melanie. We're coming to you from poolside at the, the fabulous uh, uh, Palencia Resort here in, in, in southern uh, Belize. We're joined now by the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown. Good to have you, sir. Good morning. A pleasure. Good morning. Good morning to the both of you and good morning to all of your viewers and listeners. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let, me, let, me, let me take it first. Um, I'm not sure to what extent this is on the agenda, but it, it is so, something that got onto the agenda of the CARICOM heads a couple of years ago, and, and uh, there was uh, a meeting in Antigua, was it in, in 2014, that you spoke at um, of, of, on the issue of, of CARICOMs taking on the responsibility for pushing the question of reparations uh, for, for slavery and, 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 and uh, people who, who went through that. Um, is that where, where is that in 2016? Well, uh, progress is slow, even though we're making some progress, and uh, uh, clearly it's an issue that we have all agreed to address at the level of um, CARICOM. Uh, the major proponent is uh, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzales, and um, he has been doing a great job helping us to advance that initiative. Uh, as it stands now, um, we're seeking to employ the services of an international law firm to help us to advance the arguments for reparations, but it is very much on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. now, I'll bring it back to our, our, our current meeting here, and obviously uh, the Committee of Finance Ministers to look at the issue of de-risking. Uh, it has obviously been a, an issue that has affected different countries in, in different ways. Let's talk about uh, how you have been able to assess how badly affected the different member states are. Well, practically every single member state um, within CARICOM would have been affected. Mm -hmm. as a result of um, the risking, mm -hmm. which, as you recognize, um, involves corresponding banks in the metropoles mm -hmm. deciding to reduce or, in many instances, uh, discontinue uh, corresponding relations with uh, banks within our respective um, member states. Uh, in some countries, I know in the case of Belize, uh, it has reached, according to your Prime Minister, cataclysmic, cataclysmic uh, proportions. So it is a serious issue affecting the region, mm -hmm. and perhaps the threat of um, de-risking is even more consequential, potentially more consequential than even Zika. So it's an issue that has been taken to the level of um, CARICOM, and as you indicated, there's a ministerial committee addressing this issue, and we have been devising strategies so that we can address the issue in a uh, in an integrated way and certainly to ensure that we all can join our efforts to fight this serious threat. Mm. I mean the threats are so grave that uh, they have implications for investments, for trade, uh, even for remittances. Mm. I mean many other countries uh, rely on remittances and if they don't have a mechanism in which to get these funds to us then clearly uh, we'd have a problem. Uh, even basic supplies, uh, medicines, food uh, could be affected in terms of our ability to purchase um, those very uh, basic items uh, because most of our countries they are open economies and we literally import the majority of what we consume. So de-risking brings with it serious threats that must be addressed and we have looked at various strategies. Uh, we have uh, considered to be more of a political issue that requires a political intervention. Uh, clearly what is happening here is that the various banks within these um, jurisdictions, namely Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, they have been faced with a number of fines for certain wrongdoings, in some instances withholding information and in many instances not complying with um, regulatory standards. There's no evidence that the Caribbean has been a major area for money laundering or for um, uh, uh, counter-terrorism financing or for terrorism financing. So we have been in compliance with um, the anti-money la money laundering laws, the counter-finance terrorism um, laws. We've been, f we've been found to be fully compliant by a number of international organizations, including the FATF, uh, the Global Forum, <coughs> but yet still there are states and even countries globally that continue to list our respective countries as tax havens. 
And I think that too has created a degree of nervousness for the corresponding banks uh, to the extent that they have taken the position that the potential risk of a fine, which could be in the region of hundreds of millions of dollars, or billions for that matter, does not justify uh, that type of business. So in other words, corresponding banking relations have now become, I would say, um, somewhat risky to the extent that these banks are now de-risking without thinking about the implications of literally delinking CARICOM countries from the international payment system. And clearly, if you are not part of that international payment system, you cannot settle your trade transactions. I mean, tourists will not be able to use their credit cards to pay for vacation to come to Belize. So it has serious implications. Among the strategies that we're looking at, um, they include possibly uh, setting up a corresponding bank uh, in the various uh, metropoles, United Kingdom, uh, Canada, United States, to provide um, settlement of transactions emanating out of the Caribbean. Uh, but clearly, we have to study that to determine the viability. Uh, but in essence, we must find creative ways to ensure that we do not have a situation where uh, we are literally delinked from the international payment system. Uh, in addition to that, in terms of the political interventions, uh, the uh, conference yesterday agreed that there should be political interventions at the highest level to have the chairman of the conference, um, your prime minister, uh, write to President Obama to seek his intervention. Also to have um, an intervention at the level of the Treasury Department, to have myself as the chairman of the Committee of Ministers to write to the uh, Treasury Department and to get our ambassadors in Washington involved and the other capitals um, in the um, UK and Canada to assist us in really lobbying for perhaps I'd say legislative changes, regulatory changes, because what seems to be happening here too is that at the level of um, regulations, it seems as though that there are some very overzealous uh, regulators who have actually been very stringent in their application of the relevant laws. So whereas there is no a direct policy initiative of any of these countries to penalize CARICOM countries by de-risking, it would appear that the regulators are making it very, very difficult uh, for our banks to, 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 to operate by having these corresponding um, relations. In fact, there are some who believe that there may be a hidden agenda in terms of curbing the flight of capital from these major metropolitan countries to the Caribbean. When you say some, who, who, who would you say are there some? Is, is that the well, I don't wish to specify, but I mean, there are some who are speculating that there could be some, some uh, unhidden agenda. And if that is the case, then clearly we have a major political problem here. Uh, I have to admit that uh, questions were asked as to what are the standards uh, that are required to ensure that we are compliant with corresponding um, banking requirements. And up to, up to this point, um, no one, um, no regulator, uh, no policy maker <coughs> in these countries has been able to provide any information to suggest, one, there's any violation, or secondly, if there are standards that have not been met. And that is where the speculation has come into play, that there may be some hidden agenda. Because if you say that, uh, according to the, the surveillance agencies, look at these things, give the region a, a clean bill of health, then it has to be. Exactly. Some, some, yeah. Well, again, <clears throat> you know, uh, generally speaking, we will use diplomatic language. Mm -hmm. And um, we will leave the final conclusion to the people. But clearly, it is a possibility that there may be some hidden agenda. In any event, it is an issue that we must fight, and we recognize that we have to do so collectively. And I believe that we have the full support of all CARICOM countries. And uh, we expect that this issue will be brought to some um, resolution within the soonest possible time. I mean, Montserrat is a typical example. Uh, they have two banks. They have Royal Bank of Canada, which could leave Montserrat at any time. And they also have the Bank of Montserrat. Uh, the Bank of Montserrat, I understand, they conduct about two-thirds of all business. They were recently given um, notice uh, of discontinuance of uh, corresponding banking relations uh, by Bank America just about two weeks ago. And uh, clearly, if they are unable to re-establish uh, banking relations with other banks, which is generally the case, then Montserrat may have a difficult or maybe face a difficult um, issue settling its um, trade transactions and um, settling um, investment transactions. So it's, it's a very serious issue. 
Uh, what I understand uh, some countries are now exploring, including Belize, is the possibility of having the banks approach second tier and third tier banks in the United States and in other countries to provide corresponding banking relations. But that in itself will come at additional costs because these banks generally do not have the wide network of corresponding relations. So they may be somewhat of an intermediary and then eventually you'll have to pay the bank that they're dealing with for a first tier bank. Uh, so it's a complex issue, and it is certainly an issue that represents a serious threat to the region. So what do you know now, Prime Minister, about either the impact, either uh, actual or, or potential on the question of, of remittances in, in some of your countries from this matter, from this issue? Well, up to this point, I mean, it, it is... It has not really reached crisis proportions, but we can't allow it to reach crisis yeah, yeah. proportions. Uh, so we are now dealing with this issue, recognizing it as a serious threat, and a threat that is uh, even more uh, consequential than Zika. Uh, so just as how we make preparations for Zika, and we are seeking to mitigate against um, uh, Zika, then clearly we have to be as active or even more active in dealing with this potential threat to our corresponding banking relations within the member state or the, 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 within the region. Now, you, you spoke of a, a part of Belize's strategy in terms of accessing other financial institutions other than the larger ones, where essentially uh, we wouldn't be as small fish as, as uh, the other businesses that they're used to. Um, obviously, the financial implications, as you outlined, uh, are to be considered. But in terms of what other countries are doing as well, are there any possible strategies that may work for the wider Caribbean? Well, another strategy is the possible pooling of resources mm -hmm. uh, so that instead of having um, individual banks approaching, let's say, a particular corresponding bank, to approach them jointly uh, so that they will have the type of um, economies of scale in terms of the level of business to justify the risk. Uh, so that's another area that um, we're looking at. And perhaps too, maybe in some of the jurisdictions, uh, there's a need for individual countries to have their own de-risking initiatives. I mean, where they have uh, risky banks, especially in the offshore sector, operating um, within that sector and there's not a corresponding um, return for the country or countries that they uh, strengthen their, their, their regulations, their laws and regulations to make it more difficult for those um, entities to operate within our respective jurisdictions because at the end of the day, uh, if, if, if they're the weak link um, within the system uh, and, then, uh, and it's going to have implications on the living standards of the people, then we have an obligation to act to protect our people. Uh, admittedly though, I mean, based on international standards, I mean, there's no such evidence but I presume that there will always be the scope for improvements and um, I believe that some effort should be made on our part to ensure that you know, where there is scope for improvements that we pursue those improvements. Uh, I believe for example that one of our problems um, within the region or one of our problems within the region is the issue of perception. Uh, it is well known that we have perhaps a couple of um, jurisdictions within the region that are known to be tax havens, uh, that they, they have a large amount of, um, of, of assets, offshore assets, uh, but that is not um, necessarily the same in the other member countries. And um, maybe in, in, in those countries um, within CARICOM, uh, those countries that are member states of CARICOM, uh, there's a need for them to perhaps look at the whole issue, maybe uh, changing um, jurisdictions that are tax-free to make them low tax, rather than um, these um, jurisdictions within CARICOM uh, to be seen as tax havens. And that is something that my country is presently um, contemplating to literally move from no tax to low tax. Uh, at the same time, you're getting a return and that will help to justify the risk of having um, these bank banks operating um, within our respective countries. I'm aware too that uh, during the last uh, 15 years, there has been a significant cleaning up of the offshore financial sector within the various countries of CARICOM. Uh, at one point, we had over 40 banks in Antigua and Barbuda, and I believe we are down to just about a dozen. So, having said that, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily acceding to any notion that these um, sectors are not properly, or industries within, uh, within, the, um, within the, 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 the union. Uh, that they're not properly regulated. Uh, but I'm just saying where there's scope for improvement that we ought to 
um, look at uh, improving um, the offshore financial service sector, the gaming sector, etc. Okay, Prime Minister, one of the you, 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 you talked a little while ago about some of the, one of the things that uh, your government is doing. You know, coming into this conference, there was, has been some commentary on the issue of what I would call uh, lethargy on the part of some governments on this question of, of, uh, of accessing the, the full authority of the Caribbean Court of Justice and one, one commentator saying that, that he thought that the, the, the now host Prime Minister Barrow could, would be in the best position to help nudge his colleagues to, to take their countries there. My understanding is that you are moving there. We are and uh, certainly in the case of Antigua and Barbuda it's not a case of lethargy. Uh, it's a, a divisive political issue. Uh, we have actually uh, been relatively your population. Exactly, especially among our political opponents. Uh, luckily for us, uh, a few months ago, we got the opposition to agree with us to de-emphasize the politics and to make it a, a non-partisan issue. Uh, as I say, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Uh, so we will see uh, what happens with the rhetoric, even though we recognize as we move closer towards implementation that the rhetoric, the partisan rhetoric is increasing. So the, the issue in our respective countries is that generally uh, you have to go to referendum in order to uh, get the people's um, fiat, in order to uh, uh, engage the, the CCJ, to move from the um, Privy Council to the CCJ. And um, you know there are all sorts of um, skepticisms about the CCJ, um, some very unfounded uh, notions, what uh, are perceptions. The that they have? Well, there are some who believe that the quality of justice um, coming out of the CCJ will be inferior mm -hmm. to that of the um, Privy Council, but there's no evidence to support that. In fact, the uh, quality of the jurisprudence uh, is the best or comparable to uh, comparable to any any other country. In fact, in any in, in many instances, the judgments of the CCJ that uh, that have been utilized by the Privy Council as a benchmark. And the uh, justices who serve um, on the benches, I mean, they're as qualified, ex as experienced as any you'd find in, in, in any other jurisdiction. Plus, as you know, the CCJ has the added protection in which it is independently funded, uh, which gives greater autonomy than any other courts. Yeah, uh, some, of the, some, some of the issues early on were that the, the, the CCJ judges could have been susceptible yeah. Exactly, influence. exactly. But that has been dispensed with. Well, evidently, and uh, up to this point, there is no evidence, but they have actually uh, presided over good judgments, and um, uh, there's no evidence of any perversion of justice. Is, is it a case, you think, of, of, of you believe, of, of just the holdovers from, from colonialism that you always feel that... It is. Suspicion or suspicions associated with our own. Yeah. We tend to accept uh, imported talent, uh, imported things, and you know, very suspicious and unsupportive of our own. And clearly, uh, that is one of the colonial legacies that we have to address. So, so, so the idea in, 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 uh, in Antigua and Barbuda is sort of the, the, the government is seeking the assistance of the opposition to, to sell the message to the exactly. population. So that when you go to a referendum, exactly. It, yeah. To the extent that we've taken a position that if the rhetoric increases and it becomes a major partisan issue, then we'll call off the referendum. So as far as we're concerned, it should not be utilized as a tool to test political strength. Now, not that we are not confident that we are far stronger than our political opponents, but it is such a crucial issue in terms of, um, I mean, our own independence, um, our own sovereignty, and to complete our independence and our sovereignty that we do not believe that it should be the subject of partisan political politics. So we have taken that type of philosophical position that if you're going to make it um, an issue of partisan politics, then we will remain with the Privy Council. If we're going to look at this issue in a mature way and to realize that in order to really have a truly independent and sovereign country, that we must be able to preside over our own jurisprudence, then unless we have that level of maturity, we'll not proceed. And how much has the experience of the countries who have moved into the CCJ uh, helped to assist in, in being able to encourage the opposition and others to come on board? It has been a little easier in other countries in which they did not have the entrenched clause or clauses, uh, as in the case of Antigua, Barbuda, and um, Grenada. 
uh, another country that has an entrenched um, clause, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and they held a referendum. Exactly, which became the subject of partisan politics, and it was voted down. So uh, that is really the most tangible experience that we have, and it is not a positive one, and that is why we have made um, the case that if it becomes an issue of partisan politics, then clearly it will show that our, our people have not reached that level of maturity to consider the matter this time. So if you cannot get the opposition on board, the referendum goes on hold? Absolutely. Theoretically, they are on board. They have actually signed an agreement with us. But again, what we find is that individuals associated with um, the opposition, and they are now becoming more and more vocal as we get closer to its implementation. Prime Minister, again, three years ago, there was a great urgency brought to the issue of what was happening in, in the Dominican Republic regarding this question of, of Haitians in the Dominican Republic, and that was taken on board in a big way at the summit in, in, in 2013. Right. Coming, again, coming in here, there's been commentary that uh, somehow uh, there's a lack of resolve by, by your, your, yourselves and your colleagues in, in addressing it. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I think we have done, uh, you know, whatever we could. Uh, in fact, I recall that... Um, uh, there's a resolution of um, CARICOM condemning um, what we perceive to be a uh, form of um, racism and discrimination against the Haitian people in the Dominican Republic. Uh, there's also a resolution in which we have agreed that there will be no engagement of, um, you know, of the Dominican Republic, certainly at the level of um, CARICOM, no formal engagement. So I mean, we have done uh, what we can in order to bring some pressure uh, to bear on the situation. Uh, again. My dear colleague, um, Ralph, has been very vocal about it. So I believe in the circumstances, we did all we could. But because he's not here, is, is, is this how it works? I mean, you could, you could tell us uh, uh, how things happen. Because he's not here, those issues about which he, he has sort of been, been the lead spokesperson and advocate, well, they, they, they not, won't not get the same. Not I mean, I mean, the, the agenda is not static. Uh, there are other issues that arise from time to time. And uh, each member has the right to request any particular issue to be placed on um, the agenda, even in absentia. Mm -hmm. So that is not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, of course, we know the priority issue has been the, the de-risking, and we've had the opportunity to speak with our foreign minister uh, about the action plan today. We know that will be presented uh, in right. the closing ceremony today. That's right. Any indicators as to uh, what definitive actions may come out? Well, I pretty much outlined them before in terms of exploring um, possibilities for the corresponding um, relations, including the establishment of our own Caribbean corresponding bank in the metropoles, uh, 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 using diplomacy uh, in order to address this issue, to lobby lawmakers, uh, even in terms of um, the, uh, the, the issue of um, responsibility, to, to shift that burden of responsibility from the corresponding banks to the responding banks. So there are many strategies that, we, that we're looking at. And uh, I felt too that the work that was done by the uh, various officials and the members of the, uh, the Ministerial Committee on Finance, uh, the Caribbean Development Bank, you said Caribbean Central Bank, the Caribbean Association of Indigenous Banks, uh, they did a, a great job. And I think we have a good platform on which to go forward, a number of strategies for implementation. And despite the, the threat, um, I feel uh, confident that this matter will be resolved in an amicable way. Madam Prime Minister, since we are in, in Belize, you know that again, this this issue has been of, of, of long standing. Uh, the question of, of, of the, the the threats to Belize's territorial integrity by by its neighboring by its neighbor Guatemala. What is likely to come out of, of this of this meeting on on what Caricom's position is? Caricom will continue to stand with um, Belize. I mean, it's one of the member states of um, Caricom, and we have an obligation to continue to stand with um, Belize and to implore upon Guatemala the need to resolve this issue. So again, full support of um, CARICOM to uh, resolve this um, territorial issue. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us this pleasure. morning. A pleasure. Thank All you. Right. We're going to go ahead and take a final break, and we'll come back with the wrap-up, so stay tuned.